All right, let's get started. Welcome to Statistics 115, 215, Bio 282, uh, Biostats 282. This course is the introduction to computational biology and bioinformatics. So before we start, can I get a quick show of hands? How many people here have a biology major? Okay, how many have uh, math or statistics majors? Okay, and how many have more engineering, computer science majors. Okay, great. And how many are undergraduates? Okay, and I assume the rest are all graduate students. All right, welcome to the course. Um, yeah, so um, you probably kind of wonder what bioinformatics and computational biology is, and I want to very quickly go over some history. So this is really related to how biology has evolved over the last 70 years or six years. The very first uh, part of bioinformatics is related to protein sequence and protein structure. So in 1955, Sanger invented the methods to, to sequence protein. And uh, he actually won a Nobel Prize for the technology to sequence protein. And since then, many, many groups started sequencing proteins. And every time you sequence a protein, you want to see whether the, the new protein you sequence is similar to other sequence that people have already. And so there needs to be a computational method that compare the sequence similarity between a new sequence with every other sequence that's available in the world. And so, um, people started developing sequence alignment algorithms. And uh, one very famous algorithm is called Smith-Waterman. Um, and then in 1973, people also developed this protein structure database called the PDB. Basically, just knowing the protein sequence is not enough. Very often, the function of the protein depends on the structure. So once people solve the protein crystallograph uh, crystallography structure, they could put this uh, crystal structures uh, information into the PDB. And, and as more and more protein sequence and protein structure become available, um, initially you can imagine with Smith-Waterman is with every new sequence, you will compare with every other sequence one at a time, which takes a very long time. So in 1990, uh, a new algorithm was developed called BLAST. They basically have a previous established database of all the existing proteins. And when there's somebody with a new protein sequence, the BLAST algorithm, without having to really do detailed alignment with every existing sequence, can very quickly return the sequences that are similar to your sequence of interest. And that's kind of also a very early uh, protein sequence uh, informatics. And then in 1994, when there are enough protein sequences becoming available in these databases, um, people started developing a, a, a sequence motifs. Basically, they, they ask, if you have a protein sequence, sometimes uh, in order to really predict what the function is, you can see, okay, this chunk seems like uh, a certain sequence pattern which adopts a specific structure which has a known function. For example, it binds to ATP. Another chunk of protein sequence, you know, there are enough protein that's known and the structure that's available, you can guess, okay, this part is a, uh, uh, it catalyzes some interactions and, and so on. And so the blocks database basically look at all the available protein sequences and try to, to come up with ideas of what specific sequence patterns would indicate what kind of functions. And so, Around this time, many, many groups are involved in predicting protein structures because basically once you have the protein sequence, there's usually a specific way how this protein can be folded into a 3D structure. And so um, many, many computer scientists, physicists, biochemists, they, they started using computer algorithms to predict protein structure. And everybody published an algorithm to say, my method is the best, and, and show maybe with just one example how it's best, uh, better than other algorithms. And so um, a group of protein structure prediction experts got together and they started this CASP competition. 
this is a critical assessment of structural of proteins. And uh, um, it runs every other year. I'll, I'll show you how this is done later. Um, and so that's kind of another step forward. In 1997, people started looking at proteomics. This is basically looking at many, many proteins that are expressed in one uh, tissue or one cell condition at a time. Um, and then for many years, I, I think people develop new technologies, but proteomics haven't really took off as much until in 2017, people are starting to adopt genomic technologies into proteomics by uh, using DNA barcodes directly to label each protein or each antibody in order to do detections. And so the, the protein wave was the very first wave where bioinformatics was started. And a most famous case is protein structure prediction. So we mentioned this CAS for competition. So the, this CAS competition is like this. Um, it happens every two years. On the off year, the group of organizers got together. They asked all the crystallographers in the world, uh, basically for protein structure, in order to, to really get the crystal structure, you need to have a crystal. You know, if you have used the uh, uh, salt before to get a, or uh, um, sugar before you to get a crystal, once you have a crystal, then you can get the crystal structure. And for, in order to really solve protein uh, structure, uh, for many, many years, the key bottleneck is the ability to obtain a pure protein crystal. And so usually on the off year, the uh, scientists would ask around the world to say, all, all of all the protein uh, crystallographers in the world, how many proteins do you obtain a crystal already? They would know that in a few months, those structures will be, become available. And so for all of these, they send out to all the protein prediction or protein structure prediction scientists to say, make predictions and everybody is allowed to make five predictions. And then at a certain time, they close the competition and then they wait until like a month later to see how many of those structures are really solved. And then based on a real gold standard, because basically when the competition opened, nobody knew the structure before. And then when they close the competition, they really look at the correct protein structure, then they can see, who made the best prediction. And so they, this competition has been running every two years. And uh, in 19, uh, sorry, 2018, this is CAPS 13. And so this year there's gonna be a CAPS 14 happening. We'll see how that competition go. Uh, the result is really people started critically evaluating which computational methods predict protein structure correctly and uh, a lot of computational biologists left the protein structure prediction field because previously they could just say, oh, my method is the best, but now there is a gold standard and they can really see that they are not doing very, very well. Um, so what's really exciting about the CASP competition is that two years ago, you can see um, this is the AlphaGo company that they are AlphaMind company. They, uh, they're, they're 90, eight competitors that joined this CASP competition. And um, at the end, there are 43 proteins. So sometimes it could be that there, there are say 60 proteins that has the crystal already, but by the deadline, there were only 43 proteins that really have the full protein structure uh, solved. And so out of the 43 proteins, this uh, alpha fold algorithm, which is using deep learning or machine learning, they were able to achieve the best prediction in 25 out of the 43 proteins. Whereas the second place, which use other computational algorithm or domain knowledge of protein structure, only managed to predict three correct protein structures, or at least was the best predictor in three out of the 43. And uh, what is more impressive is that it managed to forecast the first protein structure in a matter of hours. And so for these competitions, usually it runs for a few months and uh, people can still submit a better, better structure as they, they um, train their models better. And uh, obviously a, a lot of also the, the participants has been joining this competition for years and years to accumulate expertise. But AlphaFold, this is the first time they participate. So um, I think in a few months, you will see the result for the next CASP competition. And so that's kind of how computational biology is really changing the world on the uh, protein structure prediction side. Um, 
So that's kind of protein is the first wave. Microarray was the second wave. This is a wave that I was in when I was students like you guys. Uh, I remember when I was a senior in college, my professor came back very excited to say, oh, there's microarrays out there. And so basically, uh, initially it was a spotted array that's about you know, glass light about this size. And um, um, people just spotted uh, initially using hand and later using robotics that graduate student coded to spot little probes on the glass slide. And uh, this is about one centimeter square with many spots in here. And so instead of evaluating uh, RNA expression one at a time, this microarray can at that time evaluate a few hundred RNA, later on a few thousand RNA. And um, uh, this later on became a commercial solution from Affymetrix. This can actually uh, have six million probes on this single microarray of this little size here. And so basically you have a mixture of RNA that you isolated from cells and you put this RNA, inject this into this cartridge and you shake them up and they will hybridize and then wash off the non-specific binding. Then when you sh shed light onto this microarray, the different spots on this microarray will light up and it will tell you how much a particular gene is expressed or not expressed. And so this is really, really quite exciting. And uh, from about 1995 to 2010, about 15 years, many, many computational algorithms were developed for microarrays. And um, we, uh, so when I was a graduate student, uh, we develop a lot of algorithms related to microarrays, which was quite exciting. And one, uh, for example, one important application, this is um, published by uh, the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, uh, and the, the scientists later also at the Broad Institute, Todd Golub's group. So um, at the time, there were two types of leukemia. From pathology, they look quite similar, but they have, you know, there's AML and there's ALL, uh, from pathology, they look similar, but in terms of treatment, in terms of later outcome, uh, patients really have very, very different results. And so it's important that doctors can really diagnose this correctly. And so uh, this group of scientists decided to use the Affymetrix microarray in here to profile a number of samples. So each column here represent one uh, say in this case is ALL sample, and here each column represents an AML sample, and each row represents one gene. So uh, when they did the microarray, it's not just the 20 genes or maybe 30 genes in here, it's all the 20,000 genes in the human genome, and they process all of the samples uh, and, and look at all the genes together. But at the end, what they found was that there are a group of genes that are consistently higher in one cancer than the other with the hope that if you now have a new sample that comes in, and if pathology is not, is not so clear about the diagnosis, you could use the same microarray to process this new sample and based on the expression of these group of genes, provide a correct diagnosis to the patient, then the patient can be treated with the right drug. Okay, so that's um, when gene expression really become high throughput and it's really generating a lot of useful biological insights. And so from 2015 to, sorry, the 1995 to 2010, there were a lot of computational algorithms uh, developed on microarrays. And in this course, we used to cover microarray analysis as well. And this is the first year we're taking it out because of a new wave of technology. This is DNA sequencing. So you all probably know Watson and Crick, they got the Nobel Prize for discovering the DNA, uh, double helix DNA structure. And in 1972, the first uh, technology for getting recombinant protein is invented. Basically, people realize that you can cut DNA or stitch them together and start to do engineering on the DNA. And then um, in 1977, Sanger invented the technology to do sequencing. So Sanger won two Nobel Prize, one for sequencing protein and the other for sequencing DNA. And people started sequencing DNA. Um, at that time, the limiting factor is if you don't have a pure uh, DNA at a significant amount, then you can't really sequence it. So you need to amplify it enough. And so in 1985, 
the PCR reaction was invented, then you can specifically amplify one sequence many, many times. Then you can do the regular Sanger sequencing. And around that time, um, uh, the National uh, Center for Biotechnology and Information was started. Uh, they basically look at, they, they, they build a database to start collecting all the sequences into this database. Uh, including protein sequence, including DNA sequence. And with that database, now we can see the convergence. People use this BLAST algorithm. I remember when I was an undergraduate student, we used to sequence a parasite genome. It was the top 10 sequence genome in the world. And every time we sequence the DNA, we have to run this BLAST database to see whether the sequence we just got is a new sequence that nobody has seen before or it's already in the database. And if it's a new sequence, we will deposit this into the NCBI. So that new, uh, uh, so the NCBI will have bigger and bigger database of sequences. Um, and so uh, if you look at the 1970s uh, in terms of sequencing, uh, this is Jerry Rubin's, uh, so he is the Howard Hughes Medical Institute Vice President. He's a really great geneticist. And if you look at his, uh, uh, 1972 paper. This is actually his PhD thesis, which he took five years to write. And uh, if you look at the abstract of the paper, it says the nucleotide sequence of this is yeast. And it's not the whole yeast, it's one gene on this yeast. Uh, this gene is also known as the 7S uh, RNA, has been determined to be, and this is the sequence. That's it. You know, he took five years to do this work and he was really proud of this. And I remember about 10 years ago, I was at a conference and he said, this now takes about three seconds to do. <laughs> so um, yeah, so sequencing has really come a long way. Uh, so uh, around this time, well, so when, when the uh, sequencing became available and PCR became available, people realized um, maybe with enough effort, we can really sequence the human genome. It will be like the atomic bomb or the moonshot project, right? So uh, the technologies there, all we need is the uh, coherent effort and the financial support uh, from the scientific community and the government working together. And so uh, the human genome project started. Uh, initially, it was a government, office, uh, a government effort Basically, uh, you can imagine, because we have 23 pairs of chromosomes, it's like an encyclopedia with 23 books. And each book is like one kind of one chromosome. Um, and so each genome center, so at that time, there were a number of genome centers in the US. And later on, uh, eventually, the Human Genome Project was finished by scientists from six different countries. And so initially, they divided up the book then divide each book into chapters and then uh, to sections. And then once you are in say one page at a time, they can make enough copies of this page and then share the pieces, the, the, the one page into many small pieces and then sequence the pieces together and then assemble them, right? And then uh, next page and the next page. It's a really painstaking work. In fact, uh, the first 10 years of the work is just to make sure that things are divided correctly. You know, roughly you know how the sections or the pages are related to each other before they even started doing this type of sequencing. And so um, about, yeah, 10 years later, there's a private effort. Um, this is the Celera Genomics headed by Craig Venter. And he just said, sequencing technology is ready now. We don't have to divide up by all those books. If we make enough copies of this, that you, 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 you know, just make photocopies of the book and then just shred them into uh, little pieces. He called this whole genome shotgun approach. So you blast them into small pieces. And then by looking at the sequence overlap, using computational approach, you can already assemble the genome together. And uh, they got a lot of sequencing machines and he promised in much shorter time, they can get the human genome sequence available. And so there is really a race because you know, the, the government originally was going to, they, they started the project in 1990, they were going to finish in 2005, but uh, Celera, the private effort came in, they say, oh, we're going to, they, they came in around 1997 and they said, we're going to finish in, in five years. Or, um, and so there's really a competition. 
between the public and private effort. And this is really boosted by technology development and auto automation. Uh, the whole process of sequencing and also many new sequencing machines was made. And this competition from Celera really promoted this uh, effort to sequence the human genome much, much faster. Um, but really, what you can see here, at the end, uh, it's really the informatics that made a difference. Uh, because in this step, even though initially uh, the book was divided into chapters and sections, at the end, after the sequence are done, you still need a computational algorithm to really assemble the human genome together. Um, and the informatics is even more important for this whole genome shaka approach because you basically has short, well, like um, a thousand base pair sequence, um, but many, many such sequences. And it's all informatics that are needed to assemble this into a contiguous human genome. And so, um, yeah, so at the time, actually Clinton was involved to get the public and private efforts together to say, hey, we don't want anybody to lose face. Um, and uh, we'll just call it done simultaneously by both the public and the private effort. And so there is a joint announcement done in the spring of 2000, where uh, the White House issued an announcement that we have a draft human genome which means there are still a lot of holes in the genome, that there are additional efforts that are needed, which lasted for another three years to really get the genome together. Um, but it was called a success on both sides. Um, if you think about this really, uh, I think the, 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 the real beneficiary are the scientists and also the, the mass who kind of can benefit from having access to this data, which later on stimulated a lot of research and drug discovery. Um, but you can see informatics actually became really, really important, not, initially, uh, not only initially for assemble the human genome sequence, but also later on after the human genome was sequenced to do gene prediction. And so um, nowadays, I, I would really call it his as a success on both sides because uh, basically, nowadays when people do sequencing, all they use is the shotgun sequence. Nobody is doing the clone by clone anymore. At the same time, most of the genome that we're using nowadays is from the public effort that became available to the public. Okay, so um, 